So I'd like to welcome everybody to um, the, our second Ento Live webinar, which uh, ha has a focus on the National Jellyfish Survey. And I'm delighted to hand over to Amy Pillsbury from the Marine Conservation Society, who's going to tell us all about jellyfish, how you can identify them, and how you can go out and contribute to what is turning out to be a wonderful and really useful data set. So over to you, Amy. Thank you, Kieran. Uh, yeah, so hi, everybody. My name is Amy Pillsbury. So I am a citizen science programme developer here at the Marine Conservation Society. Um, and I run the uh, National Jellyfish Survey uh, for the last year and a half. Um, so yeah, before we get started, I thought it would just be really nice to talk a little bit about um, why we're interested in jellyfish. And really, the, the kind of main answer to that is that they're just really cool animals um, to have around. So they've existed for over 500 million years on our planet. Um, they're one of the most uh, unusual creatures that you can come across under the water. Um, and there are over 2,000 different species that have been identified, but scientists actually think there's more than likely um, thousands that we are yet to come across um, and yet to find out about. So in terms of the, the different species, there are some that are uh, even smaller than the naked eye. There are some that are bigger than a blue whale. So jellyfish are actually um, the biggest animal on the planet because you have uh, lion's mane jellyfish, which have been recorded with tentacles longer than a blue whale. Um, there's some that have got stings powerful enough to kill humans. There are some that can go back in time and reverse their life cycle. There are others that glow in the dark. Um, just as Kieran said, there's a, a fried egg worm. There is also a fried egg jellyfish that looks like a floating fried egg. Um, there's even a jellyfish that's been recorded um, with eyes that scientists think they can actually see kind of uh, colours and shapes with. So just some really weird and wonderful animals out there. Um, and in terms of jellyfish, they, again, they, they've got kind of amazing things about them. Um, so you might have heard that they're more than 95% water. So a jellyfish is basically made up of two membranes with kind of jelly in the middle, if you want to think about it that way. Um, but apart from that, they don't really have much else going on. So they've got no brain, they've got no bones, no heart, no lungs. Um, they do have muscles and nervous systems, which allow them to move and swim. Um, and then they do also have uh, like a, a central mouth as well right in the middle underneath. So a bit unusual. Um, one thing I'm sure everybody will know about jellyfish is that they have stinging cells. So they have little nematocysts, they're called, all along their tentacles. Um, this picture is quite a nice one because you can almost kind of see those individual nematocysts, I suppose. Um, but also just to note that some jellyfish actually have stings on their bells as well. So if you do ever come across um, a jellyfish on the beach, uh, it still might be able to sting you, even if it's been there for some time. So try not to touch them when you uh, come across them on the beach and keep your dogs and children away from them as well, because they can be stung. And then another really cool thing about jellyfish is that they're super adaptable. So they're probably one of the most adaptable animals out in the ocean. Um, I mean, the fact they've kind of survived on the planet for 500 million years gives that away a little bit. So I am going to touch a little bit more on some of the factors um, that make them super adaptable as we go along. Um, and kind of on that, these are some of the really important things that jellyfish do for us and also for um, the marine environment as well. So first one um, is that they're really good at providing habitats. So not only do crabs use them for protection by holding them upside down like this one, um, but they can use them um, for kind of swimming under. So you'll see pictures often with fish or crabs kind of going along for the ride and um, keeping nice and safe within the jellyfish's tentacles. They're also obviously an invaluable part of the food chain as well. So they're um, eaten by things like turtles. Equally, they eat lots and lots of plankton. Um, some of them eat other fish as well um, and crabs and things like that. So they're actually really good at kind of engineering ecosystems um, and keeping them under control. Um, carbon and nutrient cycling. So another thing that jellyfish are really, really great at is recycling nutrients and passing them again throughout food chains, but also really locking away carbon as well. So moving things around the ocean. Um, in terms of carbon, 
Normally what happens is um, phytoplankton, so kind of plant-like plankton, will absorb all the carbon dioxide in order to breathe because they're a plant, and then jellyfish like to eat them. And then as jellyfish die, they will sink to the bottom and lock that carbon away. So they're actually a really invaluable carbon sink, uh, as well as moving nutrients all around the ocean as well. Um, and then just some other cool things that jellyfish have done, and this is more, I suppose, in respect to helping humans out. Um, they're really, really interesting for scientific discoveries, and especially if scientists believe that we haven't come across all the species we're going to discover yet. Um, but this one here in this picture uh, in the bottom right, this is a crystal jellyfish, and crystal jellyfish are really, really valuable in scientific discoveries, but equally um, in medicine. So all the kind of discoveries that have come out of those have been used in medicinal practices. So there's something that scientists found called a green fluorescent protein in crystal jellyfish. Um, and they've basically been enabled to extract that DNA out of the DNA and um, use it as a marker in kind of um, things like Alzheimer's development. Um, and also it's thought that it can indi indicate toxicity as well in human cells. So it's kind of a really good um, marker for, for medicinal practices. It's been used in lots of things. Uh, the scientists behind it, I believe, have won two Nobel Prizes for their research into that as well. So really exciting one. Uh, and then also something I found out while I was kind of pulling all of this together, which I thought was just super interesting to mention, is that um, jellyfish have even been to space. So um, a couple of years ago, some scientists sent 2000 jellyfish to space to see how they could um, kind of survive and how they interact without gravity. Uh, they bred out at um out in space and then when they returned to um earth it turns out they actually couldn't really work out how to cope with gravity um the ones that had been born in space and they were kind of swimming around all over the place so some really interesting work going on to do with jellyfish so why are we particularly interested in them um, and what's kind of going on in the oceans and you might have heard bits and bobs about some of this already um, but i'm just going to show you a couple of photos so this is a photo of a jellyfish bloom. Sometimes they're called smacks if you get big, large groups of jellyfish. Uh, sometimes you might hear them called swarms as well. Um, so there's lots and lots of kind of areas around the earth that are seeing an increase in blooms of jellyfish. Uh, again, I've got a, another photo here and they can be really destructive for lots of different reasons. So you can see um, there's just thousands and thousands of them. And sometimes they can be so dense that there's actually even more more jellyfish than there is water um, in an area. So they, they can really get out of control and quite quickly at that as well. And the reason that this is a problem is uh, there's lots of different reasons. So one major one being ecosy ecosystem disruption. So in areas where um, blooms happen, they will overfeed and they will eat all the plankton or all of the um, fish or whatever, whatever they're feeding on that are in that area. Obviously, that means that there's a redu reduction in plankton, which is often the food source for lots of other things as well. So they can really kind of almost create their own monoculture in an area if they bloom fast enough. So they can really disrupt ecosystems. And as well as that, there's lots of impacts that they have um, on humans as well. And I suppose that is probably something we're really interested as well in as well, because um, it has really big impacts for like economy purposes. So things like fishing, you can see in this picture here, um, big swarms like that can really get tangled up and sometimes often break as well, um, lots of fishing gear. So break fishing nets, that kind of thing. Um, equally, there's been lots of trouble with fish farms. So in 2014, um, this species here, which is called a mauve stinger, uh, killed more than 300,000 salmon in farms in Ireland. There have been similar problems in fish farms in Scotland as well. Um, and that can be either because of their sting, so they might get into the fish farm nets and sting all of the fish that are in there, um, but equally it can be to do with reducing the amount of oxygen available as well. So that mass swarm will kind of suck out all the oxygen, um, meaning that the fish can't breathe anymore. So they can cause huge problems and there was losses in that case um, of over a million pounds, so obviously not great in terms of uh, the fish farm industry either. And then this picture down here in the bottom left is quite an interesting one. So this is from a nuclear power plant um, coolant intake. So they often use salt water to cool down um, all sorts of bits of bobs that go on within the nuclear facility. Um, 
And jellyfish have actually been causing some problems on the intakes. They block intakes and they've been known to actually close down entire nuclear power plants um, just from mass swarms. So in Japan, particularly, they are um, using bubbles in front of their um, coolant intakes to hopefully float the jellyfish away um, and carry them, carry them kind of on moving so they don't cause too much problems. But and again, another real big impact that we're starting to see more of um, as we go forward. Now, this is probably um, the question that I'm sure everybody is thinking about and is one that definitely you will have heard of before, I'm sure. So are they going to take over the world? Uh, and unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to give you a concrete answer of that um, because we just do not have enough evidence to say whether they are going to take over the world or not. So um, projects like this, which has been running now for 20 years, are really, really invaluable to look at that long term data series to see what trends we can see um, over time. And hopefully, eventually, to answer this question, are they going to take over the world? So again, I will touch a little bit more on this um, when I talk a bit more about the results from the project. Um, I took this from a paper because I thought it was really interesting quote and probably one that everybody should hear. Um, so a future of oceans filled with swarms of gelatinous beasts will not be a jellyfish apocalypse, but a human one. Um, so basically that is saying that if jellyfish are taking over the world and if our oceans are going to become an entire um, kind of jellyfish swamp, if you like, um, there's likely that we have some role to play within that happening. And there's a few different reasons for that. So I've listed a couple of them here. So the first one being um, how a jellyfish life cycle works. So generally what happens is you have your adult jellyfish or your medusa. They will spawn and have um, larva or fertilized eggs, which sink to the bottom and settle on, on a, a solid surface and become a little polyp. So if you almost picture kind of an upside down jellyfish stuck to the ground, um, that's a little bit like what a polyp looks like. And then it will start to almost clone itself. So they stack on top of each other. So hopefully you can see that in this little picture next to where it says polyp. And then eventually they will do something which is called strobilate. Uh, and basically that's when all the little individual jellyfish will break off um, and start their lives as kind of free floating jellyfish, hopefully eventually then growing up to be an adult jellyfish. And all of these different stages that happen within a jellyfish life cycle are um, kind of dependent and happen um, or are triggered. So that's always the word I forget, triggered um, by changes in climate. So different temperature changes can affect when um, a strobilation will occur. So things like climate change could really have an impact on how a jellyfish life cycle even functions in the first place. So that's an, a kind of one, one factor that we're definitely playing into. Um, another one is coastal development. And this one's quite an interesting one. So things like um, marinas that are being built or uh, even like offshore mooring systems, that kind of thing. Um, can actually have an impact. So there are some studies out there that suggest that jellyfish actually prefer to settle on man-made structures than they do on um, kind of like natural rocks or whatever. Um, so coastal development and increased coastal development could actually potentially mean that more polyps survive and settle. Um, equally, can be that in areas like marinas, they create a really nice kind of protected habitat away from any waves or um, movement as well or even predators. So coastal development actually could be playing a role as well. Um, fine. The next one we have is sea temperature rise. So sea temperature rise and warmer warming waters um, could mean that jellyfish species, so individual jellyfish species, are kind of expanding their range or moving their range. Um, and obviously that means that they have get to new areas, they might outcompete other jellyfish species that are naturally there, they might outcompete other species even. Um, for space. Equally, as they are so adaptable, it means that they kind of fill niches in certain areas where they maybe not have done before. So another one. Um, next one is fertilizer runoff. So uh, increasing use of like fertilizers in agricultural practices often will be uh, nearby to streams or rivers that eventually head into the ocean. And when they get into the ocean, they can cause things like plankton blooms. So algae is using all that fertilizer to grow and, and bloom, which obviously attracts um, jellyfish. 
and there can be loads and loads and loads of jellyfish and we see we often see um, blooms like that in areas where there might have been fertilizer runoff equally um, it can lead to oxygen depletion so as all of that plankton blooms they're using up all the oxygen um, and not many other things would be able to survive in that area um, other than jellyfish who can actually um, store oxygen for a short time as well and then things like moving marine industry so increasing marine industry means that again we're maybe transporting species to areas that they've not been before so things like ballast tanks in big shipping containers can move water around so lots and lots and lots of different areas and carry lots of um, species to areas where they've not been before and then equally overfishing so removing some of the predators that might be feeding on jellyfish um, could have an impact as well into increasing jellyfish numbers. So all of these things playing a, a factor factor together um, could mean eventually that jellyfish numbers will start to increase. And I think it's just really interesting to point out. Um, but what I would say is, and, and I get asked this question a lot is, um, is climate change to blame? And really, we, we it's really going to be difficult to ever separate out climate change specifically from any of these other factors that are playing into increasing jellyfish numbers. So coming on to the National Jellyfish Survey, um, hopefully some people have heard of it before, but if you haven't, I'll just run through um, exactly what we do and why we do it. So the project was set up in 2003 by Peter Richardson. So Peter Richardson is still our head of ocean recovery at the Marine Conservation Society. Um, he has a passion for jellyfish, but equally turtles as well, which we also record um, as part of our wildlife sighting scheme. Uh, then there's myself. So I joined uh, the project 18 months ago now and have been working to kind of um, expand the project and get lots more um, data use out there. And then we also work with the University of Plymouth and the University of Exeter to look at the data um, and do some research surrounding that. And the reason Peter set this up in the first place was to fill a gap in knowledge. So really, there aren't any long term data sets in the UK that tell us je about jellyfish numbers, but equally about jellyfish species as well. So what we're really interested in is spotting trends in the appearance or the distribution or the frequency of jellyfish blooms in and around the UK. So are species moving? Um, are we finding more or less blooms or more or less individuals in certain areas? And then again, we're try quite interested in what jellyfish trends can tell us about climate change. So are we um, seeing some more because um, the weather conditions are changing? changing? Are we see them, seeing them earlier or later in the year because of uh, temperature triggers? Um, and also this data set could really offer us an opportunity to predict blooms that could have, have huge impacts for marine industries in the future. So it would be great, and this is definitely um, a long way off into the future, but it would be great if we could start to predict when and where blooms are more likely to appear, um, which would hopefully reduce impacts for the marine industries. Um, I am going to go on and introduce the species that we record that are most likely spotted around the UK. But before I do that, I wanted to get a bit of audience participation. Um, so I'm going to have a little quiz to see how well you know your jellyfish so far. So I'm going to invite Kieran back in because he's going to help me out with the poll. Um, and I will share the first photo now and then hopefully Kieran can set up our poll for us. Yeah, so... With, the, with this quiz, you're going to see a series of pictures. For each picture, you should get a poll that comes up, and you'll have the eight species of jellyfish or hydrozoan that you get regularly in the visiting UK waters. You select which one you think it is, and uh, lock in your answer. Are people seeing that? Is it popping up? I can see it, so I'm hoping everybody else can. Yes, can see it. Yeah. And are you able to select an answer? Because nobody's answered yet. <laughs> it's the result of the results page. All right. Let, let, let me, that's why. <laughs> there we go. Now you should be able to see the poll. Oh, it wouldn't be a digital talk without at least one tech <laughs> issue, Amy. Right, yeah. So you should have a poll in front of you. It's got the eight species of jellyfish or hydrozoan. They are barrel jellyfish, blue jellyfish, by the wind sailor, Compass jellyfish, lion's mane jellyfish, morph stinger jellyfish, moon jellyfish, or Portuguese man of war. Um, I'm not giving any scientific names, we're keeping it simple. 
partly because I'm not familiar with jellyfish and hydrozoa and scientific names. So reading them out would have been put me on the spot a bit, I think, as well. Uh, so, yeah, so I apologies for people that are not from the UK that may even have slightly different names for these. So um, I have noticed in the chat we've got a few non-UK people, right? OK, I'm going to close that poll now. It's completely anonymous, so we can't see who's put what. But Amy, what we've got here, results wise, most people, 76% have gone for the moon jellyfish and then 15% for compass and then a few others. Nobody's gone for lion's mane jellyfish or Portuguese man of war. Okay, so. I'll, do a, I'll do a big reveal. Um, so 76% of people were absolutely right. This is a moon jellyfish. Um, so probably, yeah, probably one of the most typical looking jellyfish, I suppose, if you were to draw one, might be the one that you go to. So, yeah, well done, me and jellyfish. Should I go on to the next one? Yeah, on to the next. I'm going increasingly um, more difficult. So let's see how, how people get on with this one. OK, right. You should have the poll again. Uh, so, again, options are barrel jellyfish, blue jellyfish, by the wind sailor, compass jellyfish, lion's mane jellyfish, mauve stinger jellyfish moon jellyfish and Portuguese man of war. Yeah, so it's trickier there, Amy, as well, isn't it? Without it being nice and blowy in the water. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't, unfortunately, we don't always get reports of them in the water. So it's quite nice to see images outside just so in case um, anyone does end up spotting one on a beach. Right, I'm going to give you a couple more seconds if you haven't got your answer. Now's the time. Right, OK. Yeah. Uh, We've still got a lot of people committing to the same one. So this time, Portuguese Man of War has come out with 67%. We've got a few 14% who went by the wind sailor. Uh, what's the answer? So this is a Portuguese Man of War. So well done if you said that. But saying that, I've actually been quite quite mean there because that is a top-down image and it, it could really look quite similar to a, a by the wind sailor. So yeah, well done. Oh, oh my goodness, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Okay, next one, this one. All right, okay, that should have reappeared again. So again, options are barrel jellyfish, blue jellyfish, by the wind sailor, compass jellyfish, lion's mane jellyfish, morph stinger jellyfish, moon jellyfish, or Portuguese man of war. I'm reducing the time each time, so you, you, you're gonna have five more seconds. All right, there we go. All right, this time we've got 72% think Barrel jellyfish, but we've also got some answers for mauve stinger, lion's mane, blue, by the wind, sailor, and compass. Oh, okay. So this is a barrel jellyfish. Um, again, I've been quite quite sneaky there because sometimes it's known as a dustbin lid jellyfish. So people might also know it as that um, as well. Okay, final one. We've got one more. Oh, is this one a very difficult one? This one. All right, okay, so for your last one, again, you've got all the same answers. Barrel jellyfish, blue jellyfish, by the wind sailor, compass jellyfish, lion's mane jellyfish, morph stinger jellyfish, moon jellyfish, and Portuguese man of war. Right, okay, I'll give you a little bit more. The answers are still flying in. Yeah, this is a little bit more divided, this one, Amy. Yeah, I've been quite mean on this one, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right. Stopping it there. So this time we've, got, we've still got over half people are going for one. We've got Lane's main jellyfish, uh, but we've got 23% are going for mauve stinger. We've got some going for compass, some going for blue, and a few going for by the wind sailor. Okay. So what is the answer? So this one is actually a blue jellyfish. And I think I've really thrown people off there because it is not obviously blue. Um <laughs> Also worth saying, it is very closely related to a lion's mane jellyfish. So, but the fourteen people that got that right, give yourself a, a <laughs> big pat on the <laughs> a back. A huge pat. You've, you've passed, yeah, passed the most difficult test that <laughs> Amy was going to throw at you today. So, yeah, okay, right, Amy, are you going to tell us now how we tell these these jellyfish apart? Of course, yeah, we'll carry on. So I'll do a little bit of an intro. So. Within the survey, we are looking for eight species. Uh, so hopefully, if you have a look at our um, ID guides afterwards, that'll help you out a little bit, but I'll talk through them. Um, and the reason those eight are chosen are because they're the most commonly seen um, jellyfish around the UK. So we do get other species, but these are the, the main eight that we've been recording for the last 20 years. 
So we'll start off. Oh, I'll try and start off anyway. My screen is not working. There we go. Uh, so we'll start off with the moon jellyfish. So this is one we saw in a picture earlier. Uh, and the moon jellyfish, like I said, is is probably, if there is such a thing, um, the most typical looking jellyfish. So it is transparent. Um, often you will see that they have these four pink or purple gonad rings. Um, so almost like a horseshoe type shape in the center. Uh, and again, once they're washed up on the beach, you can sometimes see them. Sometimes they might have faded a little bit. But often if you see kind of a um, a transparent mass of jelly, then it's most likely to be a moon jellyfish. And we see those during the summer months um, and they're found all around the UK. So what I've done for each species as well, just so we can um, identify kind of where they're found, is I've put a little map. So you can see that these guys are found all the way around the UK pretty much entirely. Um, so you're quite likely to see these during the summer months if you do head to the beach. Uh, next up, we have a compass jellyfish. So you can see uh, pictures of the compass jellyfish there. They've got some really nice kind of dark. I always think they look a little bit like rays of the sun markings, but these radial lines that come off from the center um, and they can vary from kind of brown to orangey colors. And you can see a couple of the variations in some of these pictures. And roughly they can get up to 30 centimeters. I would say the ones I've seen in the UK, maybe a little bit smaller than that. Um, and also, I should have pointed out as well that on our infographics, we also have a, a sting indicator. Um, so compass jellyfish have got kind of a moderate painful sting. So definitely if you spot them in the water or on the beach, uh, don't touch them if you can help it. Uh, again, found summer months and quite commonly spotted all around the UK. And what I would point out from this map is that you can see that they're probably quite a bit swayed towards the south end of the country. And this is one of the trends that um, we've kind of pulled out as well for later, um, because it kind of sits in comparison with this next species, which is uh, lion's mane jellyfish. So lion's mane jellyfish are the biggest jellyfish. So there was one recorded once that had tentacles 36.6 metres long. Um, definitely in the UK, we haven't seen anything quite to that size, um, but they can grow up to about 50 centimetres and they have this massive kind of fiery red um, tentacles all underneath. So they almost look a, a bit like a, a fire underwater um, or I suppose like a lion's mane, hence the name. Uh, again, you can see one on the beach there in the centre. And just to note that sometimes um, these ones can be not as red as this is. Sometimes they're a bit more orangey like this top picture. And just as um, in the animal kingdom, I suppose, quite commonly, red often indicates that they are um, a dangerous animal. Uh, so these guys have a really severe sting. So definitely, definitely, if you do spot one of these in the water or on the beach, because they can actually sting for some time after being beached. Um, yeah, don't avoid it. Keep everything and everybody away from those ones. So again, found all around the UK, but you can kind of see the opposite of the compass jellyfish here. Lion's mane jellyfish are more commonly spotted up a bit further north um, in the cooler waters around Scotland. We get a lot of reports from, um, from up that way. So next up is a barrel jellyfish. So barrel jellyfish have this really nice domed top. So um, yeah, kind of uh, equally, that's why that's called um, dustbin lid jellyfish. Sometimes they can get up to a meter um, wide. They are quite a big one, often these ones um, to spot. They've got eight tentacles underneath that you can see uh, sometimes, but not always have um, a purple muscle band. So the bit around the bottom of their bell that contracts that helps them swim along um, is sometimes purple. The main thing to point out about barrel jellyfish is that they're um, a species of jellyfish, jellyfish that we see all year round. So even in the winter months, we get reports of barrel jellyfish. So this time of year, um, if you spot one, this is potentially most likely what it's going to be. Uh, again, a nice map here. So quite common all around the country, but primarily the um, west coast and the south coast. Uh, but yeah, it can be seen everywhere, really. Uh, and this is the one that threw us a little bit off earlier. So blue jellyfish, really closely related to lion's mane jellyfish. So almost look the same in that they've got a real big mass of tentacles um, underneath their bells. Generally a bit smaller, so they don't grow quite as big as lion's mane jellyfish. Um, sometimes blue, uh, hence the name, I suppose. So if you can see the top picture and the bottom picture there, um, they have a blue variation. 
But then just to confuse us all, they have a yellow um, variation as well. So like this picture in the center, um, probably one of the best tips I can give you to identify the difference between a blue jellyfish and a lion's mane jellyfish. Um, so one would be look at the size. If it's on the smaller side, then it's potentially more likely to be um, a blue jellyfish. But what I would look at is the color. So in lion's mane jellyfish, they tend to be red or orange. Whereas blue jellyfish tend to be yellow, so don't really sway up to red. So a bit lighter in color normally. Um, often they'll have kind of like purple um, radiating lines as well to keep an eye out for. Um, again, quite commonly spotted all around the UK, really. Um, you can see here north um, as well, kind of down the east coast as well, more commonly um, found. Uh, I'd say these ones we do see quite a lot in like rock pools, things like that. I get a lot of pictures of them in rock pools. So wash up a, a little bit closer to the shore. This one is a Mo stinger. So this one can swarm massively and we don't actually see that many sightings of these each year, um, particularly as individuals. So often if we'll see them, we do see them in blooming events. Um, they're a real bright pinky purpley colour, um, quite spotty looking, I suppose. And then they have these central oral arms, but then they have eight tentacles around um, the muscle band, which are really, really kind of long. And I suppose tentacly is not the right word, right word but they're um, almost stringy looking. So you can, again, you can see some pictures of them both in and out of the water there. So there's your map. So a bit more sporadic. Um, and yeah, not definitely not as commonly seen as some of the other species around the UK. Uh, and then we've got two left. So these two are a little bit different because they're actually not jellyfish. So they're something which we call a hydrozoan. And a hydrozoan is um, basically a colony of polyps that all live and work together. So each polyp will have an individual role. So some might be feeding polyps, some might be stinging polyps. Um, others will be used for things like reproduction. So they all live together um, and work together. So this one's a hydrozoan. Um, and these guys have uh, like an air-filled, gas-filled bladder at the top, which enables them to float at the surface. And then they have this sail. So often um, we'll see these in particular winds. So if the winds are quite high, um, quite often it's on southwesterly winds that we see these coming in. Um, and they have these really long kind of dangly tentacles. So as they're floating around, they can sting and catch their prey as they're moving. So here's a nice map. So yeah, pretty common down in the south and the southwest coast. Um, I'd say probably last year, February last year and February, uh, not sorry, not sorry, February, February last year, December as well. We had quite a few reports of these coming in um, up the Scottish coast as well. So definitely one to kind of look out for um, if you are heading out to the beach, particularly if it's been very windy or if there's been big storms blowing in across the Atlantic. This is one to look out for. Similarly, um, the by the wind sailor, so almost, you know, kind of look very, very similar to the Portuguese man of war. A couple of differences being that they don't have um, an air filled bladder at the top. Instead, they just have a, a sail. So you can see this kind of, they call it a chichinous uh, sail. And instead of having really long dang dangling tentacles, they have quite short um, tentacles that sit underneath that as well. So another hydrozoan that is often seen um, more in the winter months due to the fact that they again drift at the surface and are at the mercy of the winds um, and currents carrying them around the ocean. So pretty similar distribution map um, to Portuguese man of war that you can see. So quite a few up around the west coast of Scotland, but equally southwest as well. So that was a bit of a whistle stop of our eight species. And there are, these are available online. So if anyone does want to go and have a bit of a closer look, then you can head to our website and find out more information on there. Um, like I said, so those are the eight species that we record, but sometimes we do see other species and people do record these to us um, as other species. So if you go into the online form, then you can pop these down as other if you see any of these. So we've got crystal jellyfish, which again are um, very interesting for scientific use. We don't often see them because normally they're found around the Pacific, but we are seeing um, kind of increasing numbers of those. Sea gooseberries, likewise a real small little gooseberry looking thing um, that you might spot on the beach as well. And then I know this one isn't a jellyfish, but I just thought it was really interesting to include because we've had a couple of reports of violet sea snails come in. 
Um, and violet sea snails are really interesting because they feed on Portuguese man of war. So often what they'll do is blow bubble rafts to help them float at the surface, and then they'll hunt out Portuguese man of war um, to eat. So often when we see Portuguese man of war sightings, they come hand in hand with violet sea snail sightings. So if you spot a violet sea snail on a beach, keep your eyes peeled um, even more so for Portuguese man of war. Um, and then just a little bit on how to report it. So online, you'll find in our wildlife sightings area, kind of a collection of pages that you can look out for. So you can look at how to identify jellyfish. Um, equally, you can see the forms. Say so these first two are the forms for reporting either a jellyfish or a marine turtle sighting. There's a bit more information about what we do with the data as well. So what, um, why report your sightings? And then likewise, we have um, some kind of data outputs as well. So you can go and have a look at some of the papers or um, our annual report as well. So all of that is available on our website online. So next question, what have you found so far? Um, so this is within 20 years of the survey. So we've had 18,121 reports. I think I looked at that probably two days ago. Um, so it's quite up to date. And those just to mention are individual reports. So there might be um, bloom events within that. So those are just ind individual reports that we've had to us. And in terms of what it generally looks like, um, and this is going off the percentage of that species that was spotted. So for example, this year, 23.3% of, um, 23 of jellyfish spotted in the UK were compass jellyfish. So this is from last year's data. And generally, this is what we see quite commonly is that compass moon or lion's mane will be at the top. Um, I thought it was maybe of some interest, though, to show this. So this is the top recorded um, species per year for the 20 years that we've run the survey. So some interesting things going on in there. Um, and things like Portuguese Man of War. Again, we can maybe look at uh, things that happened in terms of climate that year. So maybe it was particularly windy. We had increased storm events, which led to um, increased numbers of Portuguese Man of War being washed upon our shore. Um, and likewise with things like barrel as well. So they are quite a big one. So um, something I'm interested in is are people reporting them more because they're bigger? Um, so yeah, just an interesting one to point out. But what I would say about that, that is that our data set really is not long enough to be able to say that this is actually not a normal thing. So it might be, and there's definitely some papers out there that suggest there are um, 20 year oscillations or a 20 year cycle of jellyfish kind of numbers fluctuating. So it might just be that this is, that 20 years happening. Um, so really we need lots, lots, lots more reports um, over the next 20, 50 years to, to kind of continue this trend, um, to look at this trend. And then just to point out, so this is um, one of the maps we produce, and this is from last year's data. So you can see all the different species and different points. Um, and the triangles are turtles as well, which I will touch on at the end of today's presentation. Um, but just to note, again, if you do want to go and look at this, it's on our website. So feel free to go and have a look um, and nosy around for yourself. Equally, we have this graph which looks at the time of year that jellyfish were spotted. And this is pretty typical, again, for most years. Um, so this one's from last year. So as we would expect, we see um, more jellyfish in the summer than we do in the winter months. And again, we can kind of explain some of this by um, looking at a jellyfish life cycle. So that trigger point when the temperature changes and they start to strobilate and come off um, as juvenile jellyfish. And then eventually by the summer months, they become adult medusa, which is when we see this peak. So some interesting trends there. One thing to point out is that, and somebody mentioned this to me, and I will touch on it again, is that um, I got asked a very good question, which was, do we get more reports in the summer months because there are more jellyfish or do we get more reports because there are more people at the beach to see the jellyfish um and that's that's something i'm super, super interested actually is like do we see biases in this data because of when and where people are at the, at the seaside uh, so that is something that we are looking into and researching and making ourselves a, a, as aware as we can of um so that we can at least account for those type of biases when we when it comes to reporting data uh, again, just to note that we released our annual wildlife sightings report, so that will be from last year's data, and again, it's available to download on our website, and it has all of these things in there, so feel free to go and have a read if you get five minutes. Um, and then just to pull out some trends from the data, so we've got a couple of trends here, so adult barrel jellyfish have a largely western distribution and is the primary 
primary species that can survive UK winter temperatures. So usually during the winter months, this is the one we see the most of. Uh, Southwest England and Wales are jellyfish hotspots for abundance. So we see the most um, reports come in from the Southwest England and Wales. But also what I think is really interesting that that's where we see the most species rich richness. So that's where we get reports of the most different number of species within those areas. Um, and then the third one there is that moon and blue jellyfish normally appear first in the season. So it could be that their life cycles and um, kind of their trigger point for reproducing is earlier in the season or at a lower temperature um, than some of the other species. But equally, it could be that they kind of kick off the jellyfish season, if you like, um, because there are some of the other species of jellyfish like to feed on these ones. Uh, some other ones. Sorry, I was just confused then as to whether that changed or not. So, um, yeah, the next one is barrel jellyfish may influence the abundance of moon and compass jellyfish. So this one's a bit of a um, interesting one. So when we see um, moon jellyfish and compass jellyfish, they like to eat phytoplankton. So kind of like the, the smaller plankton, if you like, so the plant like plankton. And once they've been eating all of that and they've bloomed and they've eaten all the phytoplankton, there is less zooplankton around um, because their food source is, is equally gone. Um, and barrel, barrel jellyfish like to feed on the bigger zooplankton. So often we see kind of an inverse relationship, if you like, between when, how many um, barrel jellyfish and how many moon or compass jellyfish we see in a season. Um, jellyfish are appearing earlier in the spring and staying around longer. So again, this is really uh, to do with kind of their life cycle and the potential impacts that climate change are having on when and where we see these um, animals and individuals happen. What I should say is that, again, we don't really know um, that much about jellyfish life cycles even. So there's lots of research going on into jellyfish life cycles too. So that will be really interesting to see going forward. Um, and then the final trend there is that Portuguese man of war sightings are increasing. So each year we're getting um, a higher number of Portuguese man of war sightings, again, likely due to changes in climate. So we're seeing more frequent storms. We're seeing stronger storms across the Atlantic. Um, and also all of that is kind of backed up, I suppose, by um, the fact that species are moving as well. So we're seeing tropical rain shifts of species, not just of jellyfish, actually, of other um, marine animals as well. So they'll kind of have their fixed niche, whereas like their best conditions that they love to live in a certain temperature or a certain area. Um, but as waters are warming, we're finding that their ranges are expanding, they're kind of tracking um, to keep up with the, the warmer waters. So for example, in the UK, um, maybe not specifically jellyfish, but things like seaweed are tending to track further north. So all species are moving a bit further north as they're trying to keep in their comfortable range um, and the temperatures are increasing at the equator. Uh, equally, I was talking to somebody in Australia recently has a similar project um, looking at tropical rain shift and all their stuff in Australia is moving south as well. So just an interesting one to note. So we could be seeing more Portuguese man of war because their range is expanding as well as them being blown off course by more frequent and stronger storms. So in terms of uh, when it comes to using the data, there's a few things that we're really interested in. So one is collecting a really long term data set. So we want this to continue for hundreds of years so that we can start to really pull out some of the wider trends that happen um, to do with jellyfish around the UK. Um, and again, once that happens, we can really start to kind of drill down into comparing that to climate change factors over time. So real long data sets will be really beneficial um, within this research. What's great about this data set is that it, it is really good evidence that back up other data sets, so other bits of research that are going on. So, for example, things like the continuous plankton recorder, who go out and record jellyfish, um, kind of smaller jellyfish all around the UK coastline as well. So we can have a look at their data sets and back it up with these evidential um, uh, anecdotal, sorry, uh, data sets. Eventually, we really hope that they will help us understand turtle populations. So we also record turtle sightings in the UK. Um, and we're hoping to use those two data sets together to start to predict where we might be seeing jellyfish blooms, where turtle feeding grounds might be. Um, and then equally, as we touched on before, looking at jellyfish blooms for industry as well. So just to note, that there's a couple of things happening uh, behind the scenes at the moment. So we have two wonderful students, one from the University of Exeter, one from the University of Plymouth 
looking at different things um, surrounding this data. So one looking particularly at the past 20 years. So what have we seen for the past 20 years? Um, is there any way that we can improve our confidence in the data? Are there any um, reporting biases that we're seeing? So things like people going to the beach and reporting uh, Portuguese man of war because they've seen it in the news. So that kind of thing. Uh, equally, we're really interested in looking at how useful this data set will be as a policy indicator. So within the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, um, you know, is there any use in this data set to be looking at policy change um, and influencing what kind of happens uh, in protecting our oceans in the future? And then finally, just because I've mentioned it a few times, I just wanted to touch on the fact um, that we also record marine turtle sightings. So obviously you're less likely to spot a turtle in marine um, marine turtle in UK waters. But if you do, um, we really want to know about it because they can tell us a lot about our oceans. So um, firstly, just to note that there are seven marine species of turtle, which I always think is a, a super low number. Um, and leatherback turtles are the ones that we get in this in the UK coast around the UK coastline uh, during the summer months. So these ones are meant to visit our waters. They come here to feed on our abundant jellyfish. Um, they're actually the only known reptile that can regulate their own body temperature, so they can survive in colder UK waters. Um, we had 17 reported in 2021. We had 11 reported last year. And um, this one actually is a video from last year from a lock in Scotland. So we had quite a few reported reports of jelly. Uh, turtles from locks in Scotland last year and it's actually quite rare to see a video so I thought I'd put this one in because it's quite a nice one um, and also just to note that the reporter noted in the lock there were also lots and lots of lions main jellyfish as well so uh, it was likely in there to feed and we watched it for a week or so and then um, we didn't see it again so I'm sure it headed straight back out to sea after it had finished its dinner um, if anyone is interested in turtle sightings, then you can head to uh, the Strandings website where we report with the turtle in implementation group on what we spotted each year in terms of jellyfish species. But this is just the running total um, from 1748. Um, and as I mentioned, there are seven species. So um, six of them have been found in the UK. One has never been seen in the UK. Uh, leatherbacks are meant to be here. So that leaves us with five. Um, and those five sometimes do wash up. So these pictures, so this one actually is from a report that we got in November. Uh, and this was a baby loggerhead turtle. So they should, these can get to kind of over a meter in size. Um, so this is a really young one. And this is what we tend to see with hard shell species is that they're normally juveniles when they end up in the UK. Um, and the reason for that is that they often are too weak to swim against the currents or the tides and they end up just getting washed here and often when we find them they are in cold water shock so either they might not have survived um, or like this one um, that was alive it was collected and taken to an aquarium to be rehabilitated um, I added this one in today because this weekend we actually had two uh, that were rescued so uh, one from I think they were both down in Cornwall actually this weekend um, so again, two uh, live loggerhead turtles that have gone to be rehabilitated and then eventually, hopefully, um, will be re-released, but it does take some time. Uh, so just to point out what to do if you do find a turtle, um, and probably most likely you're going to be on the shore if you do see one. So the most important thing to remember if it's a hard-shelled species, um, so anything other than a leatherback turtle, do not return it to the water. So the reason it's here is that it is really too cold it's probably in shock it likely um might not even look alive even if it is um so yeah definitely take care do not re uh, return it to the water if you can wrap it up in a, a damp towel um try and tip up its back end to about 30 degrees so that the water can drain out of its lungs um also just to note if you didn't already that turtles breathe through their nostrils so don't cover their nostrils as well and then also you can report it to us. So as soon as we get a turtle report, um, lots of emails happen so that we can hopefully go out there and collect it and help it out. Um, equally, if, if it has died, then they're really useful for scientific research as well. So sometimes we have scientists that go out and collect them. Um, and then also on our website, you can find the turtle code. So this has the phone numbers of all the different people in different regions that can help out and come and um, collect it um, and help save that turtle. So yeah, just to note, uh, finally, I just want to say thank you very much for coming along. Um, we've obviously run this program for a long time. We really, really, really want lots more sightings. We're hoping to get to 20,000 reports by the end of um, this year for our 20th anniversary. 
And also just to note that I also run um, a couple of other projects. So if you are interested in marine stuff, um, I also have a seaweed project, which looks at recording species, uh, seaweed species around the UK. Um, we also have a beach clean program. So if anyone wants to help pick up litter and um, with plastic um, work and policy change, then you can help us with our recording our um, plastic production. Um, yeah, and also actually just note, if you do live inland, then we also have an inland plastic litter pick scheme as well, where we record lots of different things for different policy asks like deposit return schemes, things like that. So again, source to see it's called, you can find out all the information about that on our website too. Uh, and that is everything for me. So I think hopefully Kieran's gonna come along and ask me some questions.